I've been really sitting here for a couple of days trying to think of something to actually talk about while introducing my guest today. And I realized that it's that f- literally the thing that makes my life stay in motion, keeps it moving, is friendship. And almost every way the reason my life is possible is because of the connections and the friends that I've made in time. Like, take, for example, this show. I don't, I don't have a big pool of guests to pick from. I don't have, I don't, I don't know people all over the world, interesting people to interview and ask about their, their little deep thoughts, their psychedelic experiences, their spirituality, none of it. I don't, I don't have that pool. I have my friends that I've been tripping with and stuff like that for years. That's all I got. So that's, those are my guests. That's also my initial listener pool. Like if you open a business, who do you, you can advertise, but do you do? You rely on those friends to support and encourage you, which, and by the way, there is, there is a difference between support and encouragement. Uh, Encouragement is like, like, Hey man, I have this idea for this this restaurant. What do you think? Do you think I should do it? Yeah, bro. You should do that. That's a great idea. That's encouraging somebody. Support would be on opening day going and buying something so you can help them stay hopeful. You can keep them um, keep them pushing when pushing is really fucking hard. And it, it, just know it's really fucking hard. It really is. So that's, 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 that's a huge difference between those two words. And I only have both of those things because of my friends. Uh, I also would like to point out that I noticed I touch on the topic a lot of, I'm not trying to make a sell. Drugs aren't cool. That's not what I'm trying to say. And I stand by that all the time. That doesn't mean that when you don't get two people who really enjoy something together, they're not going to fan out. It it's inevitable. We're passionate. We appreciate these things. So when me and my friends and I'm sure even when people I've never met or know on a deep personal level start to talk or let me interview them about these topics, there's going to be that moment where it sounds like like drugs are cool. And people are going to believe what they want to believe, and I'm fine with that. But just just know deep down that everybody is everybody's allowed their own interests. I just have my story to tell, and that's a part of it. My friends have a story to tell. That's a part of it. And a lot of other people out here have a story to tell, and that is a part of it. And we do appreciate and enjoy those things. And they are cool to my life. So there's always going to be that moment that comes out. Uh, I also was listening back and I was thinking to myself, a moment where I talk about mushrooms, about how I say, I don't care what nobody says, this, that, or the other. This is just what's true. I don't, I don't fucking know that stuff's true. That's one of those things like a a Christian knowing God is real. I'm not here to tell you otherwise. I appreciate and respect that you believe what you believe, but I still know that a lot of the things I say and a lot of the things I believe about psychedelic drugs can be very much a placebo effect. But if that placebo, and yes, I did just relate religion to a placebo effect. Um, I'm not sorry. Uh, but I am very aware that a placebo effect could be active in my brain on a lot of things. But if it works, who who am I to say, fuck it? If I'm a better person, if I'm a happier person, if I'm able to, to go further with every endeavor of my life simply because I think something did something, then it really did do it. Whether it's chemical mental or somewhere in between it really did do it so don't be quick to 
put down somebody's means of, I guess, furthering their journey. Some people, some people do yoga, some people meditate, some people do psychedelic drugs. I do more than just one of those. Um, but it's all, it's all the way of finding yourself. And if you choose not to do those, don't, don't fucking do them. I still find a lot to be learned by understanding the experiences that other people have had. Uh, it's the same thing as when we like to watch the History Channel to understand how people lived in drastically different time periods how people learned to deal with stress back when back when they didn't have things like television or or books you know what i mean or even psychedelic drugs we like to put ourselves in the shoes of somebody else and that's the opportunity that i do provide here for me as the host interviewing the people i interview and for you as the listener vicariously understanding my life and the guests that I have on my show. So there's no reason to to discredit somebody's journey just because you don't agree with what they said or they don't have the scientific evidence to back it up. If, uh, if the placebo effect of, of something in life makes you go places... Buddy, go places. Please go places. Go far with it. And don't look back at all the people who told you no. Now, with that said, do I believe that the psychedelics are nothing but a placebo effect? I do not. I just believe it's another one of the many tools that allow us to truly discover ourselves. Truly, truly. Um, my guest today is honestly one of the most unique people I've ever met. And one of the most genuine, caring people I've met in my life. I've known him for probably about five years now, six years. Uh, and since the day I met him, it, he's been a very significant presence in my life. He was honestly the person who, after almost a decade of not doing psychedelic drugs, decided to sit down and explain to me a lot of my misunderstandings about the topic because of experiences I had when I was younger. And as you can clearly see, that's done nothing but change my life for the positive. And I am eternally grateful to him for correcting my misunderstandings, if anything. Um, he's, he's a funny person. He's a very, very relatable human being. And anytime, anytime I sit down with this person, always starts out like anything else, just goofing off, having a good time, happy-go-lucky. And it always gets to be some form of more, more deep, growthful conversation, philosophically, business, whatever it may be. Um, I also would like to just take a moment to warn some people that there's a very graphic story that is shared in this interview um and uh i'm trying to think of a good way to prepare people like it's it was a moment in somebody's life that truly truly changed them and they took nothing but lessons away from the experience however there is a very sad story that is told during this episode that relates to the loss of the life of an animal. So I would just like to warn people going into it that that's going to happen. Um, you will know ahead of time when it's about to happen if it's something you would like to skip over the graphic part of. Um, I probably will not have timestamps or anything like that. You will just have to be aware of that moment if that's something you choose to do. Um, with that said, nobody on this podcast encourages the harm of animals or animal cruelty in any way. Uh, I have two dogs and a cat in my household that I love very much and they, I would, I would do anything and put my life down for them and anyone else that's ever 
on my show, including the guest today, feels the exact same way about pets that they've had. So I just had to throw that little disclaimer out there. And now I would like to introduce everybody to one of my best friends on this entire planet. Uh, he goes by Matt or more, well, his name is Matt, but he goes by and what I like to call him Panda. So everybody, I would like to introduce my friend Panda. Like when we tried recording with uh, Bro for the other thing, like there was like a whole plan. And there was like an outline, a structure for what we wanted to do. And then me and him just sat down and hit record. And I was just like, hello, <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, got to wing it sometimes. I feel like that's going to be every introduction for this. It's just a just a little wing, like just like a hello, how are you thing. I also I got him to do the artwork for the thumbnail and I got oh, okay. him to send me the send me the picture that he drew of you for your birthday for this one. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. So it's going to be the pig, yeah, the little Rick and Morty looking, <laughs> little Rick and Morty looking Matt. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> this shit's going to be great. But yeah. Hello. What up? How you doing What's today? Up? Do I should, do I tell them your names, Panda or Matt? It doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm raised in the South. You can call me whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> what up, <are> y'all? <laughs> How's y'all doing today? Oh, my God. Yeah, I didn't like... Like, it's still like... Because last time I didn't even know, like, I just started talking about it first, why I was making the show. I don't want to talk about that this time. People know why I'm making the show. So now I'm in this weird little like, like thing. It's actually kind of cool. Let me see here. I got to come up with some verbiage real quick. I don't think I was excited to talk to do this with you because I'm pretty sure until I started talking to you about psychedelics for the first time after I met you, I hadn't done them in a long time. And it was yeah, through, through... I forgot I was the one who changed your whole view on them for the yeah, like current was, time phase. For real, because when I met you, we were just talking and we got talking about it. And I was just like, yeah, I do. I do like to... I, I used to, I said, but not no more. I don't feel like... I feel like I've gotten a little too old and life's been a little too much. I like that. I like that. That's a vibe. <laughs> That's a vibe right there. I don't even know what's up with mine. I did put mine on silent, so at least you, I got that going for me. Yeah, mine's on silent. That shit was funny. Well, silent other than the random rap music for a tenth of a second. But Hopefully that's not enough to get your copyright striked on YouTube. Man, I hope not. <laughs> if it does, I'll just slash the audio out for that one particular portion. Just one millisecond of cut. Uh, but... It's actually funny because for somebody I connected with on firearms, talking to you about psychedelics is the reason after almost a decade of not touching them, I finally decided to try acid for the first time. And it was only because you told me about microdosing. And the first time I tried to microdose, I ended up taking two tabs of acid. <laughs> And I just said, micro. Some uh, in there for... uh, no, that was a macro dose to the max. <laughs> that yeah. was a max row dose. Max row <laughs> and that was funny. That was funny. And now, now I've done more <laughs> than psychedelics you did ever as a kid. in the last three to four years that I did as a teenager. And I've stuck steady on my stream of tripping like three times a year. <laughs> Oh, man, that shit is funny. I don't know, but I get the most out of those. <laughs> I feel it. I f bro, I'm trying to think. Like, when I first started tripping again, I went on the craziest little, ironically, rabbit hole. Not ironic. That's not how you use the word ironic, everybody. <laughs> I just ironically use the word ironic like everybody else in the world does. Coincidentally. Fucking basic bitch. <laughs> I coincidentally uh, went down a rabbit hole of probably doing psychedelics multiple times a week, every week, to the point that 
I actually had a friend that would limit how much I was allowed to get because they didn't like the fact that I was tripping so much. And everybody, that's not a good thing. Just know that. That's not a that's not a good way to go. Don't don't lose your mind. But uh, but no. Well, I mean, my thing is the way I look at it, you were because the last time you had done psychedelics, you were how old before the more Nin- recent? 19. Grab that can for me. Thank you. 19. Yeah, and what 19-year-old knows how to handle themselves on any intoxicating subject? Like, you give a 19-year-old free access to anything that will get them out of a sober state of mind, and they will abuse it. I feel like you were just wrapping up the tail end of that experience. Because the last time you had used it, you didn't have the maturity to use it properly. Actually, so that's would, the only way you knew how to use it. I would have to say the last time I did acid before then, I was probably like 17. 19, 19 would have been mushrooms. Yeah. So it's like, which I still don't like. Yep. And I'm not a fan of them either myself, personally. Jono said the same thing. Lean more on the side of uh, LSD over uh, mushrooms for me personally. But, you know, everybody's body chemistry is their own. So Have you ever microdosed mushrooms? I've Never thought had. about it. I haven't done it. I've considered it, but I it's easier for me to microdose acid. It's a lot easier to cut up a piece of paper than worry about weighing out some uh, mushrooms. I feel that I would have to make tea. Yeah, the, the the best experience I ever had on mushrooms was with tea. Same. We did it back in high school. I think I was like, we actually went we went out to a cow field because I grew up in Florida. So this was a if it was a summer day. And it rained, which it did every summer day. Yeah, I was going to say, it would it's rain not. for 30 minutes just to make you hotter. No, it, would, it would rain for 30 minutes just to make us mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, we would go out and just pick them. And we'd go back to my buddy's house. And I mean, they'd still be like, like wet. And yeah, we, we like, would, like mushrooms. <laughs> like, not dry at all. Not dry like people are used to. And we would make tea out of them. But when I say visually, fresh mushrooms was probably one of the most, vi- like, it's so much more visual than even, like, the dry ones. I don't care. I don't care what everybody I've ne- says. I've never had the opportunity to try fresh, I have one friend but... who said some one person's head turned into an apple in front of him. Yeah, that only happened to me on, like, salvia. <laughs> like, thousand X salvia extracts. That was about the only time shit really changed. I've only done that once. I didn't do... I did it... It was like 150x. Yeah, I had a very short stint of trying salvia. I did it like five or six times in a week with a couple of friends. And then I lost interest in that shit. But that's one of those ones that's very... It's very ritualistic. Like, there's a lot of like... Like... I guess like ritual, shamanistic, like use in salvia in certain parts of the world. Well, I mean, there's a reason it's called sage. True. Like the name comes from somewhere. Yeah, because like me, all I did was laugh for about 10 minutes. I laughed. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. I didn't really have... I've seen those videos on YouTube of the motherfuckers having the bad trips on that. I do not wish that on my worst enemies because that looks awful. I mean, I could. I wouldn't say I didn't enjoy myself. I just don't know what the point of it is. Like now, me, I didn't. I don't feel like I really experienced anything. I would be interested to try it now, having done DMT, acid, because that was the, to me my my intro into hallucinogens. Because uh, I started off on pretty much everything late. Like most of the people I know started smoking pot when they were like 14 to 17 i was shocked because i knew you for a while when you told me the first time you started doing it like actually experimenting with drugs and i was actually i was shocked because it was much later than i expected yeah i i literally i had had alcohol before with my parents on a few occasions of literally just like a sip as a teenager you know whatever no big deal um not enough to really feel any effects Um, the first time I drank alcohol, smoked a cigarette, and smoked pot were all simultaneously on my 18th birthday. 
Never planned on smoking a cigarette, but I was 18 and my friend I was with wanted to smoke, so I grabbed a pack of smokes for him because I can now. I did the same thing on my 18th birthday. And then I was like, well, fuck it. I can buy them. Let me try one. Became addicted to them. Thankfully, a couple years later, LSD helped me get rid of that problem. Um, we'll get back to that later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel it because I could say the same thing about alcohol. Yeah. LSD. Came smoke pot smoked uh or drank some beers for the first time got drunk all on my 18th birthday which i mean honestly i'm kind of thankful for i don't know i I don't think i would have really been able to control myself had i been any younger than that on given the opportunity with intoxicants i feel that that's a word what intoxicants intoxicants yeah i'm pretty sure i'm sure it is i would know i I would believe you if you (laughs) told me that Uh, like um I have fairly strong grasp of English language. <laughs> yeah, like, I just, half the time, like, I'll make words up and I'll be like, is that really a word? Like, for a while, it was a com- converse or conversate. And I found out, technically, now they're both words, but conversate's not really a word. Yeah, converse is a word. Converse is a word. Converse is definitely a word. Conversate, I've definitely said that. That's like I always call Canada, Canadia. I feel I- wrong after I say it. It's like it's like it's like the word irregardless. Like, <laughs> but oh man, I I feel you though, because when I say that I had absolutely no respect for uh, intoxicants when I was I, I you are not coming in, cat. I'm sorry, he is too much. Uh, last time he came in and he was clawing on stuff and just being way too disruptive. He eventually gets the picture and walks away for a few and comes back and annoys us again later. Yeah, he figures it out. But I, I had no respect for drugs until I was probably 26, 27 years old. When I say no respect, like the whole point was to get fucked up. I used to actually refer to getting drunk as, like, having fun. Like, that was having fun to me, was getting fucked up. Like, it was just... So, it it wasn't until I got much older that I was able to... Now, I will say, being humbled by a psychedelic after experiencing 27 years is significantly different than being humbled by a psychedelic after experiencing 17 years like what am i being humbled over yeah like being an asshole like <laughs> does it... yeah for me psychedelics weren't until much later other than salvia i didn't get into uh i think my first mushroom trip i was 22 i didn't try acid until i was 23 24 25 somewhere in that range all the years kind of blur together now, so I don't remember anything, but damn, I sound older than I am. <laughs> I feel it, because I'm one of those people that feels weird sometimes when I... When you deal with technical errors, hey, we're good. I just didn't trust that that was going to... Stay there and be good. Like I didn't want it to like make the driver stop processing, and then we're just not recording for the whole time. But uh, that would that would be horrible. I recorded six and a half minutes um, with Jono with no with his mic turned off. That's not good. And then we had to stop and restart. It was <laughs> funny. But uh, what the hell? What the hell was I saying when I deal with what? I don't know. That blunt done got us. Yeah, I swear to God. All of a sudden, sorry, everybody. My uh, I had a update pop up on my computer and it closed out the str- the recording programs for a second so i had to go fix that and then i lost my entire train of thought of what i was actually talking about because i am ad add as fuck i don't know something about being humbled at the age of 27 yeah i don't know it is what it is but um i'm actually shocked you kept it that long if you would you say that out of any psychedelic then, since clearly it's not going to be mushrooms, since everybody who comes on here establishes very quick, it seems that they don't like them. Um, I, I don't dislike them. It's just I haven't had the best experience. With I, I feel like if I gave them, if I did microdoses, I wouldn't have any problems with it. I just have no desire to go balls deep on a trip with 
just mushrooms. I always love them until I don't. They just prove me wrong at some point. For me, it's the combination of physical discomfort with... It's it, the physical discomfort with the dealing with your trauma at the same time <laughs> does not generally bode well. It can put you in a dark headspace if you're both physically and mentally uncomfortable. And you kind of slide, not to use it ironically, but down the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, that is, that's very real. I don't know. Like, I always, for me, it's weird because... I do find them to be very emotional. I just seem to always have bad luck and something bad happens when I do them. And that's all it ever is. And that's, it's the weirdest thing in the world. I had a whole, I collapsed on my floor one time. I was going to say, I I had a panic attack another time. Thinking back on it, my worst mushroom trip was worse than the time I accidentally killed a kitten on acid. I, that's that's hard. Yeah, that's hard. Man, that's that goes that just got deep. Last time when I was when I do and I did this with Jono, Morty was outside meowing, and I explained to everybody that in my head, when my cat scratches at the door, I picture myself opening the door and kicking him in the face. And now I feel like I feel like I wish I would have made that joke. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. So what ended up happening is we literally had some kittens that were just old enough to really start exploring and uh wearing some very heavy shoes while tripping and didn't realize one of the cats had literally just walked underneath me as i went to stand up and yeah what was the rest of what was the rest of the experience like uh if you don't mind me asking is it dark uh, honestly, very sobering, very quickly. Very sober. I forgot that I was tripping, because like I and I made the very irresponsible choice of trying to drive to a vet's to see if they could save the animal, which they did not. You just got you got you sorry yeah you felt for that thing and you just you yeah, just started uh, going. Thankfully, uh, the veterinarian's office is about a quarter of a mile away from here, <laughs> which not too too far of a drive. Thankfully, because yeah, not an advocate of driving under the influence of anything. Just as a notification, I don't condone no, I, that. I feel you. No. But you know, the situation was a little crazy. No, I understand that. That's a rough story. It was, but I mean, it. It was one of those things where, like, in my head, I couldn't. I didn't do it intentionally. Yeah, no, I understand. And, like, my brain didn't make me feel guilty for it. It was just like, damn, this is sad. Not guilt. Not, I didn't feel any real negative emotions other than, like, the sadness over the loss of the life. I didn't hold myself responsible. Like, No, I understand. It's, it's like... It's like a... Like if you're driving down the road at night and the dog runs out of the yard in front of your car real quick and you happen to hit the dog, yeah. you you're you are you're destroyed, but you know in your head like I couldn't. Uh, there's nothing I could have done. And I'm not willing to, and especially in that situation, I'm not willing to trade my life for an animal's life. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna drive into a tree at 70 miles an hour to avoid your dog. I'm sorry. Like, exactly. And I wouldn't expect anybody else to do the same for my For my dog. dog. That is correct. No, I completely understand. That's a rough story. That's a that's a serious story. I don't know what I would do if in a situation like that. Yeah, it was definitely heavy. Especially the people I was with were way more attached to the cat than I was. They yeah, were. I don't know if I've ever really had something. I usually if Usually, if I'm if I have neg have to deal with negativity while I'm uh, tripping, it's trauma of some kind. I, I've never really had a direct experience right there. Where it yeah, usually like, oh, it's shit. usually it's a uh, peeling back some old trauma, not creating some fresh trauma on top of it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's rough. That is definitely rough. Whew. I mean, it did though, kind of. Uh, it kind of changes your view on death. Nah. Well, I mean, let's 
that's a that's a whole different thing. that's a huge left turn with psychedelics as it is you would have started talking to because what i say there is nothing on this planet that will uh and now now we're getting into some of the stuff i really love talking about here with this getting into the real deep deep stuff here but uh nothing is ever going to make you more i guess welcoming not welcoming in the sense that i want to die there's nothing wrong with embracing the idea of death, though. That's just coming to terms with reality. It's an acceptance of the inevitable. Yes. It, you don't you don't actively search it and look for death, but you but the fear, don't fear it. The fear of death is one of the most... It hinders people it's their entire life. It's very debilitating. Life. Correct. Very debilitating. Um, so that's, that's where, like, agoraphobia, like, that fear to just leave your house... That plagues hundreds of thousands of people. Like, that fear of death can literally have you locked down with no social life, no friends, no nothing, just because you fear for death that hard. But I, at this point in my life, thanks to psychedelics, I I could walk out this door, a meteorite could impact me, and I would be completely okay with it. I could go out into the... Now, I don't want the pain. Like, I don't want a slow, painful death. You don't even want death. But I don't want death at entirely. all, but I'm okay with it if Correct. it happens. It's like, one thing I will say that, and this is more, I would have to say more just from a DMT experience than anything, you really do understand real quick that this is a, like, this is a rental this body like this is a rental it's like uh, it's like it's like a car that i'm taking on vacation type shit like uh once i'm done with this vacation i'm gonna probably go on another one somewhere else so it's like that's uh like jonah was talking about when he did dmt last time and he was talking about how he's always felt like he's a radio more like a radio tower conducting a signal from somewhere else and when he did dmt he said he immediately knew he was back where the signal came from i don't know where that is but i'm back where the signal came from and he was like it was so reassuring that it doesn't matter when this life ends or when uh, whenever all this is over no matter what happens I'm just going to go back where the signal came from and then there's more to do. So it's it, the, when you know for a fact that dying doesn't actually mean dying, it means moving on. Mm -hmm. How can that be scary? Yeah. Like, and that's just real. Like now that's just, and that took, that was, that was DMT. Cause I would have to say like, even, and I'm not, like I said last time when I was, Recording Joe, no, I'm not trying to make a sell with anything. I don't think anybody should do drugs if they don't want to. If honestly, if you don't think you should do drugs, it's the last fucking thing you should ever even think about. You will find no answers or no assistance in anything if you don't think it's for Yeah, you. if you know yourself and you know you don't need that influence in your life, you know you. But at a time in my life, I needed to experience acid. I needed to experience DMT. Because I needed the lessons that were going to be delivered to me. And maybe later in my life, I won't need it. I don't know. Maybe, you know, because my usage. <coughs> he died. Yep. Uh, it's definitely. That's ironic. <laughs> that's idiotic. Uh, um, my usage has definitely changed over the years. Because when I first delved into it, I was definitely a little aggressive on it, just like you were at first coming back to it. But, like, I've reached a point where I value its effects more because of the scarcity. The fact that I don't take it on a regular basis means it's like, a, it's like going on a vacation for the soul. It's why they call it a trip. Yeah. Like, there's people, there's a reason the verbiage is out there for this stuff. I actually never thought about that. Yeah, like, that's, that's yeah, that's that, that, I've always kind of figured that's why they call it a trip. <laughs> yeah, oh, I mean, you're definitely going somewhere else. You are going somewhere. That's a, if you, if you had to pick, just in your, now, I don't mean a, one psychedelic i mean one psychedelic experience that you know for a fact after that experience you were pro 
you were cha- like that experience changed your life more than any any other psychedelic experience. Right, Could you pin? Answer. Huh? Right, Usually people do. Um, for me, it was the acid trip that I had that made me quit smoking cigarettes. Um. So at the time, mid twenties, I think I was like twenty five. I was a two pack a day smoker. Um, That's crazy. I've known yeah. you a long time. I and I know I couldn't was, see that. It was right before we met. That's it was long. very shortly before we met. Um, but yeah, I was a two pack a day smoker. Um, bad habit. I used to deliver food all the time for uh, Domino's. Literally, I would get in my car, light a cigarette, drop off someone's pizza, get back in my car, light a cigarette. It could be a one and a half minute drive. I was lighting a cigarette because I just sat down in my car. I was that person. And, uh, that's wild. Yeah. And it was literally. And you said you never smoked cigarettes until you turned 18? Yeah. That's wild. Um, so I was literally. Don't smoke, everybody. Do not smoke cigarettes. <laughs> Like, I'll tell my kids, you can try a lot of damn things, but don't try meth, heroin, or fucking nicotine. Like, those are, like, <laughs> the big three to avoid just because of the addiction factor for me. I feel that. Um, Not that anything else isn't addictive, obviously, you know. But, uh... Once you start delving into mental addiction, you get... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah she, that's, a, that's a whole different... <laughs> yeah, you're like, we can make the argument it's all addictive then. Yeah. Um... But yeah, I distinctly remember, so I had taken two tabs of some really good LSD, and I was laying on a couch that I was, at the time, literally sleeping on, because I lived on a couch at the time. Um, I was at the point in the trip where I was, like, just past the peak, and I had put on some... It was like psychedelic stoner rock, put on some headphones, laid on the couch and grabbed this giant pillow and hugged the shit out of it. And like for me hugging it, I could feel the compression on my lungs. And I'm like, I'm 25. I can feel myself straining to breathe. At that point, I literally forgot about every other aspect of my body other than my mind and my lungs. Those were the only two parts of my body I could be aware of. I didn't feel like I had legs. I didn't feel like I had arms. I just knew something was wrong with my lungs. I'm like, I'm 25. I can't be struggling to breathe, just laying down, tripping. Like, that doesn't make fucking sense. Something is wrong. Something is not right in what I'm doing. And I assessed every aspect of my life. I'm like, is it the marijuana? Nah, nah, I'm good on that. <laughs> like, I'll smoke that much weed. I smoke like three blunts a day. You know, I ain't nothing like that. Nothing too <laughs> So it ain't the weed. Oh, it's probably the two packs of cigarettes you hail down every fucking day. Uh, you know, that makes fucking sense. Like, I should just quit that shit. I had literally bought two packs of cigarettes that morning. Like a monster outside my room. (laughs) I literally bought two packs of cigarettes that morning. They were sitting right next to me on the table next to the couch. Like three of them smoked. The song came to an end. I opened my eyes. Remembered I had the rest of my body. Looked over at those pack of cigarettes and was like, I don't need this. I have not touched a cigarette since. I literally went like three and a half years with no nicotine and then I picked up vaping again because I got stressed out. But definitely still a lot better than cigarettes. That's an amazing story. That is an amazing story. That my quitting alcohol story is not that not that good. No, like I literally remember because it was so profound to me. That's a good story. That like I, I remember my thought process. Like, it impacted the way I think because of the way that I thought. Like, it'll, because for me, the way I describe it is like it changed my perspective. But it didn't change it drastically. Like, 
it literally was like a two or three degree change, but it was enough that I could see around the obstacle that had been in front of me. And I could see a detour that made sense. And I wasn't just blinded by the thing that I had been staring at for the longest time, oblivious to it. So I, it literally changed how I think about things. It changed how I describe thought. It changed how I think about how people think like and I, that's one of the biggest things. That's why I respect LSD so much. Cause like, that's that's real. That's a really good story. That's a really good story. I swear to God, that's a good story. Cause yeah, I was telling. Uh, I wish I could really remember. Cause I know when I quit, when I quit drinking. I mean, everybody knows the reason. Cause when I say, if in. If any of y'all look me up on, like, Instagram and see a picture of me, like, I'm small. Like, I'm, like, 130, 140 pounds. Like, I'm little. Five foot four. Um, I used to be 220 pounds, and I used to drink easily a 12-pack or more a day. And I wasn't much of a liquor drinker. Like, I actually drank liquor to get fucked up. I drank beer to just drink beer. And... I know a couple nights before I had gotten in an argument with a girl and I picked up a beer. I thought it was an empty can. Either way, it was irrational decision. Um, I picked up what I thought was an empty can and I chucked it at the wall. And I did it so fast and so furious I didn't realize it was not only a full can, it was not even an open can. And I put it through the wall. If you remember my old apartment, I had the hole I, in the I, wall. I remember. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> you never actually explained that to me, but I never <laughs> also pride because I let people do they, them. But. Yeah, but uh, so that's where the hole behind the chair came from. But uh, a couple days later, I was tripping. And I was sitting there, and I was thinking about the same girl. I was writing in my journal about her. And I went to get a beer. And... I went and sat down because as I was, I used to like beer a lot when I was coming down from my trip because it made it easier to fall asleep. And I went and I got a beer and I sat down on, on my futon at the apartment. And at the time, the hole was just there because I hadn't gotten the new computer chair yet from the restaurant. Yeah. So it was still in front of the computer desk. And I opened the beer I'm drinking the beer, and I sit there, and I see the fucking hole in the wall. And that's all I remember is seeing the hole. And I just laid down for a few, thinking, just thinking. And I got back up, I took another sip of beer, and it tasted awful. Just tasted awful. So I just didn't want any more to drink that night. And then for some reason, after that day, every time I went to drink by myself, when I was sitting at the apartment alone, and I drink beer. I could drink liquor, I'd be fine. But beer tastes bad when I'm alone. I mean, I think... <laughs> and this is true. Yeah. Now, it's not like this no more, but I also don't feel the drink urge... In excess, like I don't beer. feel the urge to even drink beer anymore like that. Like, I might... I had a beer earlier today. I drank half of it. If that, maybe the one right third. there next to you? Actually, it wasn't. It wasn't that one. But yeah, same idea. Anybody who's watching this on YouTube, you can see there's a beer here. This is about how much I'll drink out of a beer now. I used to drink over 12 of these a day. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that's what I love about hallucinogens is its ability to just rewire our brains. Because like establishing those new neural pathways and it literally will change the way you think. And the way you view things and the way you perceive things. I really like what you said about the, uh, you were talking about how like it just shifted your perspective a few degrees and you could now see around the object instead of it being in your way. It's like the difference between like when you're making the blind right turns and you can't see who's coming around the other side. But when you're making the left turn, you can see it just fine because the road's wide open. Yeah, It's like that shit, that shit was real. That made a lot of sense. That was, was a good analogy. And that's my thing, too. Like, especially if you use it responsibly. The change is... 
it's very rare that I've I've seen where something will change instantly like that, where you'll just change up a whole habit over a matter of minutes. But we both have experienced something very similar. And that's where I think the healing properties come from. Because you really the thing is you've got to confront the problem. Like you got to be aware of the problem and you got to have a consequence for it. And if you combine, like if you see the consequence of your actions or feel the consequence of your actions while you're tripping and you know, the source of it deep down, your brain will change because it real, it, it already had realized a billion times ago that those were not the things for you, but you were enforcing the wrong pathways it's like uh, it lets you. We're we're really quick to forgive ourselves for mistakes, but we hold such grudges against other people, and it gives you that ability to instead look at yourself like you're that other person instead of yourself. It's no longer like looking in the mirror. It's like you're talking to someone else. Well, that's why uh, I actually looked it up right before we started. Um, have you ever heard the word sonder? Yeah. I love that word because... I actually don't really know what it means, but I've heard it. Okay, so the definition of the word is the sudden realization that everybody you see's life is just as complex and rich as yours. Everybody is the main character of their own that's a, that's, 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 that's something everybody could learn. And that to me is just like... The way I say it is like, it's like watching a TV show. When you watch a TV show and you have that outside perspective, you look at their actions and you're like, they're fucking dumb. Why would they make that mistake? And you but li- every and you day like- you're in your head living your life making those same mistakes. But that acid lets you look at it from the perspective of an outsider and be like, damn, why is this idiot making those mistakes? Then you get put back in your body and you're like, oh, I'm that idiot. Fuck, I need to stop making those mistakes. That's real. That is so real. That shit is... Man. How long has this been going? 38 minutes? Okay. Still got like... Still got like 5 to 10 minutes. Now we move on to DMT. (laughs) (laughs) See, and like... I. I really, you want to know, funny enough, what I actually am excited to do? Because at first when this started out, like, this is one of those ideas that has continued to grow. Because it started out, well, I mean, it really started out a few years ago as a blog idea from somebody else. But uh, that got just put off for almost indefinitely. And then it just came back as the podcast. Then it became the podcast and blog. And then uh, now... I've gotten to the point where I've been sitting here talking like I can't wait to interview people who have no experience with psychedelic drugs and just kind of talk to them. But they they know stuff about it enough that you could just talk to them about life, period, and see how they actually go about solving the same problems or getting that same end result that like maybe I would use a psychedelic for. Because like there's so many people out there that like, Because we can't sit here and act like, nobody can sit here and act like anything is this end-all, be-all, super solving solution. Like, LSD is not the truth, everybody. Like, that's crazy thinking. Um, But, like, so it's really interesting to me that, like, I sit here and when I see the problems that I've solved through acid and I see other people with them, I'm going to think, man... Just take some acid. You'd be all right. Like that's just that silly little thought that goes in yeah. your head when you're when you're a tripper. And but I I really want to talk to these people who solve these problems that I actually use psychedelics as a tool to solve. And I would like, wonder if there's a way. Because like if you could f- simulate a form of therapy. Well, where... med- meditation. I've talked to people with meditation, and they'll even say the out of body visual experiences that they've had. And these people don't do any drugs. They don't even smoke marijuana, or drink anything. No and... power to them. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But uh, they um, they have completely sober, clean state of mind visual out-of-body experiences and that is the biggest trick to being able to solve your own problems is is taking yourself out of your own head well that and i mean my thing is you can't fix anything without doing work Mm -hmm. 
including yourself. You can't fix yourself unless you're willing to do the work. And there is a way to get the job done sober through meditation, Absolutely. through therapy, through all kinds of different methods, yoga, you know, all these different things help. But just like doing any task in the real world, there are tools out there that can aid you if you use them properly. Just like it's much easier to take down a tree if I have an axe. But just like if I use the axe in the wrong way, I won't get results. If I hit my leg with an axe, I'm just going to hurt myself. Just like if I abuse LSD, I'm just going to make my life worse because I'm abusing a substance. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. what you're abusing. If you're abusing it, it abuses you. They, opiates can have a purpose. Yes. Opiates have a great purpose. Alcohol has a purpose. For, just as a social lubricant, it has a purpose. But anything used in excess and anything abused cannot be healthy for you. That's the way I view LSD. Because I, I would love to see us as a culture get to the point where it's not uncommon for you to be like, look, doc, I feel like tripping. Let me book you for three hours. I want to come in there and at my peak, I want to talk through some shit with a psychologist. You know, and that's completely socially acceptable. That'd that would be great. That would be perfect. Especially if you have psychologists who never are... thought about that in my life. No, never once thought about that in my life. Well, I also, I'm one of those weird people who impulsively would rather try to figure out. Like to me, going to see somebody to figure out something in my head is almost crazy. Like I can do it on my own somehow. Like I am that guy, but uh, I've never really thought about the idea of taking psych- psychedelics and going and seeing a professional who actually is meant to help you with the reason you're taking psychedelics it's just just, that's a profound idea for me my my thing is just like our conversation here of you seeing the way i think helped you think in new ways what if i pay somebody whose job it is to know how to think and know how to think in a healthy manner and teach me while i'm at my most vulnerable state how to think and how like to process and all this stuff i feel like a lot of it would stick better especially a lot of those deeper topics Because I'm very, like, if you get me in the right mindset, I am very open. Like, especially Mm -hmm. on hallucinogens. You and I have tripped together. We had great retarded conversations. (laughs) (laughs) And anything like that, I feel like, especially with a specialist, like, if one of us decided to go get a psychology degree, we would be perfect at that. Be able to just sit there. We... And no, you're not being judged. No, everything you've gone through is accepted because I've gone through just as much shit as you. Like, to have that energy while you're tripping would be super healing. That's why shamans were around. That's why you had a shaman who was an old head who had gone through life. Those shamans were there because they had experienced everything you could experience. You live in the woods with them. They every danger you've experienced, they've experienced, and they can walk you through it. And that's the energy that needs to be brought back to the psychedelic community here in the Western world. Because we view psychedelics as one of two things. A party drug, or I'm going to do this in my dark hole by myself. Mm-hmm. And we need that. When, and it's been happening in the medical and educational field. They've been doing a lot of uh, interesting therapy with mushrooms and end-of-life therapy um, for cancer patients where they set them up with a psychologist and talk them through their shit. And it works wonders. People's anxiety drops. They get off of SSR, or, uh, not SSRIs, uh, fucking Xanax because they don't feel the anxiety anymore. They're okay with the, what's happening to them. And it's... PTSD and MDMA is the same way. Yeah, there. I was, just, I was literally about to say that I read something about that where like some of the newer studies that are coming out about PTSD with small doses of MDMA is like almost like like making it non-existent. Yeah. Like because it's pairing happy feelings because they're actually doing what you're talking about. They're putting them with medical professionals while they're on small doses of MDMA to talk about the negative experiences but because mdma gives us nothing but happy feelings it's rewiring their brain to pair a happy feeling with a negative experience and it's Mm -hmm. making their life just way less heavy yeah and it makes perfect sense because like if you think back on a memory or any kind of thought like that you're gonna bring back 
the associated emotional responses. And it's completely healthy to have a negative emotional response to a negative physical event that's happened in your life, a past trauma, abuse, any of that. It makes sense from a psychological perspective. But you have to attack the problem with the same kind of thought process. You have to build them back up. You have to rewire the way that the brain thinks about the trauma. And that makes perfect sense. If you're wiring the brain to every time it experiences that trauma and it's thought about, you can't not be physically happy because you are enjoying yourself because of medication. That's just another tool. And if we utilize it properly, like... Because I'm not saying go out there, pop two fucking pills of Molly from a random guy in a club and you're going to have no PTSD. Obviously not. Yeah, that's crazy. You're, you're taking pure drugs that are tested by, a, you know, a qualified, certified doctor. And you're being helped by a qualified, certified professional in a controlled, safe environment. And if more people got to experience drugs, because that's what I think a lot of people's experience with drugs are bad. Like, how many p- people think c- Coke, rich white people drug? Why? Because it's generally taken by rich white people in fancy-ass parties and mm-hmm. high-class bathrooms and fucking strip clubs. Like, But a lot of other drugs, like, a lot of people's first experience with LSD probably isn't in a nice, clean house, surrounded by friends that they trust entirely people who have been through it and stuff like that ruins the reputation of the drug just because you did it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And if we can establish a culture of respecting the drugs, respecting the intoxicants and just knowing the time, the place and the environment for things, we would be so much better off as a culture and our laws need to reflect that because these people need to see the different experiences. It's not all just the bad experiences. And because it's so taboo, it makes people... The only good experiences that exist are on the taboo end of the world. So it makes us not want to talk about it. Yeah. Because by not talking... I mean, by talking about it, we feel like we're participating in a negative world. Instead of trying to bring positive to something that's actually positive. Yeah, it's just like um, I've experienced this with... Because I was raised super Christian. Mm -hmm. I I was raised Baptist, Presbyterian, all kinds of different Christian denominations. Um, And they drill it into your head. Drugs are bad, drugs are bad, drugs are bad, drugs are bad, drugs are bad. And even if you don't think that like on the surface, like if you actively thought of drugs and you thought, no, they're not that bad, but deep down in there, that thought still exists of I'm doing something wrong because drugs are bad. It's drilled into you. And those subconscious thoughts can sometimes pop out for people when they're tripping. I've experienced it with somebody where it was their first time. They didn't, they basically, once they got tripping, they started thinking, man, this is great, but this you know, this is illegal. I shouldn't be doing this. And then they got in their head because just because of the law, legality of it. Like it wasn't even the fact they were having a bad time. They didn't enjoy how they were feeling. They were just like, man, this is illegal. I can't be doing this. If I get in trouble, blah, blah, blah. And just that thought alone was enough to ruin their experience with it. But if we didn't have the laws there that were saying, this is a bad thing. Don't do it he would have never had that negative experience and it could have possibly changed his life. Yeah. Cause of course you're going to have the people who want to say, but that's true. It was illegal. He shouldn't have done it. But think about, we, we use drugs every day. Like we use well, drugs I mean, every it, day. It's, it's purpose. illegal for me to run a red light. You know what I'm saying? But it's, if I've got a person bleeding out in the back of my car, do I give a shit about the Absolutely law? Absolutely not. If it's going to cause death and trauma, why do I care what the law says? If I'm doing what's best for me, why do I care what the law says if it doesn't hurt anybody? If my self-exploration journey is causing no harm to anybody else, why does somebody above me say I shouldn't do it? Because I'll wake up and realize I'm being controlled, maybe? But that's 
that's the like that's the thing like i don't like the fact that someone's self-exploration journey can be blocked just because someone who might have had a bad time back in the 70s or or you know the people running mk ultra realized that shit was too strong realized <laughs> <laughs> and said that shit should be illegal but <laughs> Once they started questioning why why that we had them in that room, we yeah. realized that this was not the best idea. <laughs> Shut it down. Go watch the beginning of Pineapple Express. Why sub I... LSD. <laughs> <laughs> why did I sign this military contract again? <laughs> that shit is funny. That's a, I feel like that's exactly what the beginning of Pineapple Express is based off of. Basically, is oh, MK Ultra, Ultra yeah. just sub in weed. Yeah. <laughs> oh shit! Men who stare at goats. Yeah, that shit is. That shit is real. Oh, my God. And it's crazy, though, too, because, like, I don't really see, like, even if the, even if you had a bunch of people realize they're being controlled, quote, unquote, doesn't really matter, man. Doesn't really matter. Like, life is still going to go on exactly as it did. All they're well, really going to do is suck it up and figure out how to live their best life in the process. <laughs> I mean, that's really all you can do. Like, and honestly, even if if every American citizen just woke up and stopped following the laws and just lived by their... The government wouldn't be able to really do anything. No, I mean, that's why prohibition didn't work. It's why marijuana is drastically becoming legal everywhere. It's why you are now seeing these studies with these drugs. Because once everybody's doing something, you can't lock the world up. No. I mean, it's it's crazy. Like, when you had, when you had police officers going behind closed doors at illegal gambling games, drinking illegal alcohol with gangsters, how do you... How do you p criminalize this? Yeah, it only works with weed because I piss dirty for thirty days. Yeah, so it's like you put this extra little enforcement in there that makes it a little harder and a little more unstable to fight on that end. Yeah. but but how do you enforce something like that when everybody's doing it? You don't have a society if you lock everybody up. No, you got slaves. That's about it. And then now we're just now we're just repeating history again and life's gonna life's gonna get rocky as hell and that's a whole other conversation for a whole nother day <laughs> whole different style of podcast <laughs> i swear to god that's a so whole... follow us for our philosophy pod no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> i did see this video one time and then i'll probably start wrapping it up hitting 55 minutes but uh i saw this video one time on youtube that was like a bunch of people enslaved and the guy decided to free all the people enslaved and told them, you're free, you can leave, or you can stay here, and you can work, and we'll provide your meals, and you'll have places to live, or you can leave, just know if you leave. You can never come back. There, well, no, there's no, other, there's no other free land anywhere else. So if you leave, they're either going to kill you, or they're going to take you and make you That's slaves right. there. So, so you might as well just stay here, and it's like this, this, this little like disguising enslaving people that's i mean that's really what society is to be honest but uh oh, it's the it's the that's what a minimum wage job is. yeah <laughs> but it was uh it was disguising freedom i mean disguise disguising slavery as freedom yeah and it's, it was a very interesting video to watch because well, i mean that's why immediately after slavery was released here in the south a lot of african americans just stayed where they were you get paid a little bit of coin and you do the same shit you know people love stability and I understand it, but the growth never occurs when you're stable. That is true. As a person, you generally don't get stronger, you don't get smarter, you don't get tougher, you don't get wiser unless you step out of your comfort zone and experience something that you've never experienced. That's why, you know, people need to just step out of their ruts and literally, I think it's funny, uh, I looked up, uh, I've seen like studies on like how neurons fire and literally the electrical signals will follow the same exact route and your body can do that very, very well. That's why you can drive somewhere that you go to every day and you don't even remember the drive. Yeah. Cause you ran so far on autopilot that your brain was like, these memories are pointless. We have 57,000 copies with every weather variety at every time of day, what do I need this memory for? Dump. 
And we do that with most of our lives, with our work and our experiences. We repeat the same patterns because they're comfortable. But we need to get out of our comfort zones. And we need to experience and we need to grow. And every time one of us grows up, that gives an opportunity to pull somebody up with us and share our experiences share the things that we've learned be they the hardest lessons or the easiest with somebody and not every time you share it's gonna take but don't stop because the one time it does take that could be the one thing that makes all the difference to one person and that one person can affect 20 and that 20 can affect a million and i can can honestly say that if anything in my in my life has taught me more than anything else other than, I mean, and I, you can't even say, I, I can't even say that because experiences is just all encompassing of everything. So that's just life. But the, the, the experience, the one, the one experience that has taught me more than anything else is friendship. And that is real. And that's one thing I was looking around is like, I do have a very diverse friend group. I, I have friends that all are, walks of life. I, I have lawyer friends, teacher friends, restaurant owner friends. I have drug dealer friends, obviously. I'm on a podcast talking about psychedelics um had to get them from somewhere (laughs) had to get them from somewhere uh i have i have asian friends white friends black friends it's just hispanic friends hispanic friends so it's like it's such a diverse i have such a diverse pool to pull from and I also have a very annoying cat that is gangster as can be, who's about to get kicked in the face. If y'all have watched a previous episode, so uh, I on. <laughs> that was sad. But uh, I, uh, damn it, dude, stop meowing. But what I was gonna say is, uh, I, god damn it. This cat, bro, does this to me. There's a whole, there's a part last episode where I had to stop and try to remember what the hell I was saying because I stopped to yell at the cat. But uh, no, um, I have friends from every every little group and everything. And by by that, I am able to experience so much more than that person who just sits in their comfort zone all day long and just knows what they know because I have actually taken the time to go out here. And that's really what I'm trying to accomplish with this show is because I know for a fact that I have learned more from just sitting here talking to the people in my life than I have anything else. And that's why if you even look look on uh, the website that I made, like the little subheading says, like the truth starts with talking about it. Like people, people don't want to just go meet people, talk about stuff, and figure this life out together. Well, and the thing is too, a lot of people, the conversations that really matter don't happen. Because the conversations you and I generally will have with somebody on the street, very, very surface level. Yes. The real conversations are when you can dig up that dirt and be vulnerable. And I've, like you said, I've learned more from people telling me about the times they fucked up. The times they've made mistakes, where they've they faltered. Had one of the moments that they've had, so it become it, it gives and, me and a if relation. Not, if not the exact moment, something very similar. Very similar. It gives and, me something. To and even that. if I haven't had something similar, I keep it in my brain because someday something similar might happen, and I don't want to have the same reaction they had. I don't want to have you know the same negativity neg- negativity that blew up in their face. You know whatever it is experiencing through people is the best way to learn but you have to be smart enough to pick up on it because generally it's like with kids you can tell a kid don't burn yourself on that it's hot a million times but the lesson isn't really fucking learnt until they burn themselves and that's a lot of people that is a lot of people but if you can get out of your own head and realize other people's experiences can be more valuable to you than you realize because they can teach you all the pitfalls like it's literally like if i was to drive down the road and say i was five years further down the road and i call back i'm like yo so when i went down that area there's a lot of there was a weird detour in the dirt really smooth but if you go in the road there's a bunch of potholes i experienced it it might have changed a little bit from when i was you know times changed but that was my experience if you can listen and learn, you will enjoy yourself way better than if you just run headlong into the bullshit. Yeah, no shit. No shit. Listen to people, people.
listen to people. <laughs> Not just us, because we're retarded sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we a little bit. <laughs> it was like I said to Jono last time. I said, "Yo, oh, man, it was just." Uh, I did. A, uh, it was like I can't remember how it was, but it was like I don't know. Man got confused, took a little drugs in the process, but I'm figuring it out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm figuring it out, <laughs> and that yeah. is the truth. Oh man. Well, well, sounds like we're gonna go figure it out and do something else. Had a great podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. I swear to God, I really did. I enjoy this. This is a very fun recording process because, like, I never know how to get into the the true subject matter so you just gotta just kind of just start talking that, well i think that's the thing with the podcast you just go with it you it's a conversation go. like it's not perfect i'm it's not a speech i ain't delivering shit to you these are the words that are coming to me and by being such a vulnerable topic i like the idea of not having to like i want people to be able to know the people who come on here even if they say something very personal or something vulnerable like i want them to be able to do that because like it's most of these shows you f i feel like are way too doctored up way too hollywoody i guess and it's like some of this stuff is better off just being real yeah just that, being the raw real. uncut footage tells the story i swear so like that's why like last episode there wasn't a single second cut out like i don't see me cutting a single second out of this there's no reason to that's the point as long as as long as nobody says some really dumb stuff <laughs> and on that note fuck those <laughs> i'm just kidding I feel it. That would be hilarious. Just cut it off and fuck those. <laughs> <laughs> what was he going to say? <laughs> police. It's coming straight from the underground. <laughs> <laughs> fuck those police. <laughs> but, well, with that said, I really would appreciate it if everybody would take the time to hit the subscribe button. If you're watching this on YouTube down in the corner, do the, do the thing. Uh, you'll be or notified whenever a new... Somewhere down here. Somewhere down there. It is right down there where he's pointing. Uh, be notified whenever we drop a new... Whenever we... Uh, whenever I drop a new episode, he'll probably be on another one another time. But he won't be on every one, but it's just... Yeah, request it. I'll be back if you want me. Um, yeah, let me know if you want to see more panda. 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 See, I like how your shirt has a panda on it. <laughs> Yeah, it's very appropriate. I didn't even plan this. It is very appropriate shirt. It's a, it's a trippy panda. Trippy panda. It's a trippy panda. Yeah, Just... I got the space inside me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you're listening to it as a podcast, hit the follow button. That way you'll be notified whenever a new episode drops. Uh, you can go check out my uh, website. I'll have the uh, link down below. I got a blog on there, all kinds of cool stuff. All so. the stuff's in the doobly-doo. So uh, go ahead and show me some support, and I really appreciate it. I'll uh, see you all next week. Uh, say bye to Panda. Bye. Bye to Panda. Bye to Panda. <laughs> <laughs>